we're um, talking about something that we started talking about last week. Last week, we talked about leaky gut and we discussed what leaky gut is. And don't worry, I'll catch you up if you didn't watch it. And what we do know from last week is that leaky gut is not just in your gut. Um, when you have leaky gut, it affects everything. It affects your skin, your mental state, hormones, joints. Pretty much any chronic issue that you have is probably linked to leaky gut. And so today, a lot of you might be saying, okay, well, how do I know I have it? Is there a test for it? How can I test for it? And if I do have it, if I already know I have it, or if I suspect I have it, what should I do for it? And that's what today is going to be talking about. Leaky gut, how to test for it, and what to do about it if we have it. So a quick catch up for anyone who watched who watched last week, because you maybe you don't remember because you have other things to do in your life. Or maybe you're one of the very few humans in America who didn't watch us last week and you need a recap. Let's do a quick recap of what leaky gut is. And of course, I encourage you to watch um, last week because we went into much, um, de- much more depth into it. So leaky gut, when we eat food, our gut has a really important barrier. And that barrier has an, two jobs. One is to let the good stuff in. It lets water in. It lets nutrients in. And the other is to keep the bad stuff out. So that barrier is super important to keep us healthy. But for some people, that barrier is a little bit weak. There are these tight junctions that for some people get a little loose, and then certain things can pass through that are not supposed to pass through. When it passes through, it causes inflammation, and inflammation will cause disease. But before disease, it will cause you to feel really unwell for a while. So that is what leaky gut is. And leaky gut can cause allergies, asthma, autoimmune issues, hormonal issues, chronic fatigue, stomach issues, skin, mental health issues, muscle pain, joint pain, you name it, leaky gut is probably at the helm. So leaky gut is more than just your belly feeling off. It really affects everything. And as I said, if you didn't watch us, I really encourage you to watch us. It's right on our Facebook. Go ahead and click on that. So as promised, we talked about how to test for it. I first want to tell you that you don't have to test for it. I will tell you how, but you don't have to test for it because what you can do is start implementing the protocol that I'm going to talk to you about later on. Because the good thing about functional medicine and integrative medicine is by implementing something good, if you just make a healthier choice and it helps you, then guess what? You probably have leaky gut. But implementing a a healthier choice it doesn't have a downside, right? There's no side effect to eating a sweet potato. There's no side effect to having to eating a broccoli. So for people, you know, if you're taking a medication, certainly as a side effect, you want to check it out, but you kind of have no risk by just doing a healthier option. So if you're not sure and you don't really want to test, just try the protocol. If you feel better, then you probably have leaky gut. And I tell this to my patients all the time. My patients will come in and say, Hey, how do I know if I'm lactose intolerant? Um, Stop drinking milk and eating dairy products and see what your stomach feels like. You don't really need to test for it. If your stomach feels great, you're probably lactose intolerant. If you reintroduce the dairy, you know, you're probably lactose intolerant. So it's the same thing here. You can implement the protocol that I'm going to talk to you about. And if you feel great, then you don't need to test. So that being said, I promise you, I'll tell you how we test. So I'm going to tell you. There is a test out there in case you Google it. It's called the lactulose mannitol ratio. Um, it's not a test that we use often, but I felt it was important to, to mention it because if you Google testing, this will come up and I don't want you to go down this road. So the way it works is you drink something called lactulose with a type of sugar, and then you check your urine to see if it came through because it's not supposed to come through. But this has been proven to be not as accurate as the, as the newer tests. This was a test that was kind of used um, a decade ago. And so there's better testing out there. So if you see that one, I would skip it. It's great if you want to read the research behind it. Um, A lot of um, conclusions were drawn from it, but we've gotten more sophisticated since then. The way to test for leaky gut is with blood testing. Let me take a moment and explain how it works. So at this point, I think everyone has heard the word antibody. Antibody means that your body is reacting to something. So it recognizes something as a foreign object and it creates an antibody to it to fight it off. So if we have an antibody to something in our blood, 
it means we were exposed to it. And I feel that most of us know what that means at this point, but I wanted to explain anyway. So there are four things that we test for written here. LPS, uh, let's start with LPS. LPS stands for lipopolysaccharides. And these are proteins that are not supposed to pass through those tight junctions. We're not supposed to have antibodies to them. So if we have antibodies to them, it means that they pass through the barrier and that's an indication of leaky gut. Occludin and zonulin are chemicals that are used to control that gate. And when they're open, that is released, occludin and zonulin. So if we have antibodies to them, again, indication of leaky gut. And lastly, there's this thing called the actomycin network, which again is not supposed to pass through. It helps regulate those tight junctions. And if we see antibodies to it, Again, it means leaky gut. So today's testing is really uh, blood testing. Um, you cannot, however, order it um, at your basic lab. You cannot go to your doctor's office and request it. Um, don't try it because it doesn't exist in regular labs. You can't get it in you know, the typical lab at your doctor's office. These are specialized labs that can only be ordered by a functional medicine provider. So... If this is really important to you, I want you to find someone who will order it for you. But as I said earlier, you may not need to test it because um, you could just implement the protocols and it will take it from there. So let's jump in. It's time to talk about this protocol. So the protocol is, it's the four R's of fixing a leaky gut. Remove, replace, re-inoculate, and repair. Let's talk about each one. I'm going to start with remove. Sounds kind of obvious, like, yeah, I should probably remove some of the stuff that hurts my belly. So when we talk about removing, we're removing foods, but also pathogens. Let's start with foods. Certainly, at this point, you know that there are certain foods that we just have to remove. Basically, the junk food, and maybe a little bit more. Because the foods will cause inflammation. And if you remember last week, if it causes inflammation, causes a leaky gut, no, now those inflammatory proteins go in, that inflammation causes us not to feel good, causes disease, which causes more leaky gut, which causes more to leak in. So you get stuck in this bad food leaky gut cycle that you have to break by changing what you eat. People without leaky gut don't have this because the bad foods don't go in, but people with leaky gut, this is a really bad cycle to get into. So we have to remove the high fructose corn syrup, the sugars, but also the gluten, the corn, the soy, and I don't want to say that it's a one-size-fits-all diet because some people actually have to remove more. Some people will have to remove legumes. Some people will have to remove certain nightshades. Some people have to remove grains and eggs. So it is very individualized, but the biggies that are kind of obvious to you, they have to go. Some things are going to be eliminated forever. Sorry, like dairy. But some things will be able to be reintroduced later on once you're healed. And again, that's going to be individualized. Now, as I said earlier, it's not just food that has to be removed. You may also have to remove a pathogen, a very common pathogen. Pathogen is a fancy word for like a bad bacteria. One of the common ones is called H. pylori. You may have heard of it. So I'll give you an example for myself. Even though I'm a really healthy eater, my stomach issues just weren't falling into place. And I had to do a special test for H. pylori. It's a simple breath test, which you can get at a regular doctor's office. And I found that I was positive. So even though I removed all the foods, I wasn't getting where I need to go because I need to remove the pathogen. So removing is removing the foods, but also removing the bad pathogens. So we have to make sure that anything that's in our way, anything that's harming has to go out. So before I continue on to the next R, I want to take a moment right here, right where you remove the foods, take a look at how you're feeling. If you're feeling already better, guess what? You have leaky gut. You don't need the test. If you're on this protocol and your skin clears up, your joints feel better, you suddenly can bend down to pick up your wallet when my patient says that to me and I love it, then you probably have leaky gut because all we did so far was take away the stuff that really is bothering your belly. So consider that not only is that something I want you to do? I want you to pay attention of what things got better. So sometimes there are surprises. Like let's just say you went into this because you have really bad psoriasis and your psoriasis started clearing up. Well, that's great. But notice other things. Did the ringing in the ears go away? Did your joint pain get better? Did your digestion get better? 
And the reason you want to notice these things is because those are your tells. When you pay attention, let's just say the ringing in the ears got better. If you introduce something two, three weeks later and the ringing in the ear comes back, guess what? That's your tell. That means that that food doesn't agree with you. So pay attention to everything that got better and use those as signs when you reintroduce to see if that thing that you reintroduced actually is good for you. As I said earlier, if you're feeling good, you probably have leaky gut, you may not need to test. If you're not feeling good or not feeling good enough, that's a great time to start testing. That's when we have to say, okay, is it leaky gut and something else? Is it not leaky gut at all? So sometimes you can just start the protocol, get healthy, because anyway, it's a good thing, as I said, and then we can decide if we need to test. That's how we do it here at the new method. So moving on to our next R is replace. This is a critical piece. It is not enough to just remove. A lot of people will just restrict and they're like, okay, I can live without gluten. It's not enough because there are really important parts to your digestive system that if they're not on point, eating all the good stuff in the world is not going to help if you can't get the nutrients out of them. The way we get nutrients out of food is with stomach acid, HCL, and pancreatic juice, which is enzymes. If we don't have enough stomach acid and pancreatic juices or enzymes, we cannot get the nutrients out of our food. And as always, I always apologize for background noise here. It's a busy office. I'm sorry for that. We're not in a studio. So just roll with it. Um, and if you don't hear it and I'm just the one hearing it, that's even better. So we're going to replace, we need to replace the stomach acid and the enzymes. So a quick recap of how the digestion really works. We eat food, digestion starts in our mouth with an enzyme called amylase. It starts to break it down. It goes to our belly. Our belly starts hitting it with acid and some enzymes and starts to break it down. And then it further goes down to our small intestine, which, which also puts more enzymes in it and breaks it down further. That's how we get nutrients out. That's the perfect system that kind of goes down. But if you don't have enough of these juices and these acids, the system slows down. Let's just say you have some protein. Now it's sitting in your belly longer because it can't break it down. When things sit in your stomach longer, there's a little opening here called a sphincter that will stay open because it's just kind of sitting there. And that's when people start to experience reflux. What happens when people experience reflux? They run and they get antacids. So they take an antacid, they feel better, but what do they do? They actually suppress the acid down even more, which is a big problem. Because to begin with, they have low acid, they get this reflux, they think it's high acid, they take an antacid and they perpetuate the problem. So if you have reflux, you might want to consider that you actually don't have enough acid instead of thinking you have too much acid. I know it's a crazy concept, but it's the real truth. Now, always I want to say, don't stop taking your antacids. If your doctor puts you on something, keep taking it. Keep taking your Prilosec or your Pentaprazole, whatever is prescribed to you, and make sure that you talk to your provider or whether it's a regular doctor or a holistic doctor about coming off of it in a monitored way. Cause you can't just come off of it just like that. Uh, it can cause some issues, but I just want you to know that if you have reflux, it doesn't necessarily mean that you have too much acid. So going back to that scenario, that piece of protein is sitting there. It's not getting digested. There's reflux. Now this protein that's not fully broken down is going down to the small intestine. Small intestine doesn't have enough enzymes. Guess what? it's not breaking it down either. The whole system is slow and it's a great place for bad bacteria to grow. And now we have too much bad bacteria and that's a problem also. So if I'm not gonna go into which enzymes to take, how to test if you have low HCL, what, how much HCL to take, that's a whole talk by itself. What I want you to get out of this is that replacing your enzymes and your acid are just as important as removing the offending agent. Otherwise, you're going to be eating the good food, but not getting the nutrients. So that second R, super important, which brings us to our third R, re-inoculate. Could be a word that you're familiar with these days, but I'm going to tell you what we mean here. So re-inoculate. As we discussed in the past, it's really important to have enough good and bad bacteria in our belly. Re-inoculate in microbiology means taking an organism and putting into something. 
So in this case, we are going to take good bacteria and put it into our gut. Okay, that's what this means, reinoculate, because we need that balance. Another word for good bacteria is probiotics. You're all probably familiar with probiotics because they're sold everywhere. So remember, we have to have a good balance of good and bad bacteria. So last week we discussed when that balance is off, it's called dysbiosis. We don't want dysbiosis. We want things to be balanced. Dysbiosis happens from two things. One, the standard American diet. If you eat the standard American diet, you're going to have more bad than good bacteria. It's just the way it works. But the other big offender are antibiotics. Sometimes we need to take an antibiotic because we don't feel well and we have to kill a bad bacteria, but it also kills the good bacteria. So basically, if you eat a typical diet and have had antibiotics at any point in your life, you probably have dysbiosis and you're going to need probiotics to balance it out. So you could take it in the form of a supplement. I'm sure many of you have already known about these supplements for probiotics. And that's a great way to get that good bacteria in. But there's also a way to do it with food. So types of food that we want are fermented foods, okay? Fermented foods are foods that have bacteria as part of their cooking process. A food you may be familiar with is something called yogurt. But yogurt is, we like to avoid it because it is high in dairy. So what we recommend instead is sauerkraut and kimchi, which is fermented cabbage, or kombucha, which is fermented green tea or pickles, which are cucumbers. So we talked about probiotics, getting it from a supplement and getting it from uh, food, but we also need to talk about prebiotics. Prebiotics are the foods that actually feed the probiotics. I don't know if you've ever heard of this term, but when I first heard it, I didn't know what that, mean, what that meant. So prebiotics is, is how we feed the probiotics because good bacteria are alive and you need to feed them. So prebiotics feed the probiotics. Good prebiotics are leeks, onions, asparagus, bananas, garlic, all of that. You want that in there so that the bacteria can keep going. Because if you take the probiotics and keep eating the standard American diet, guess what? They're not going to grow. It's not going to work out for you. So you need all of that together. Bringing us to our last R, which is repair. It is important to repair the gut. We remove, we replaced, we re-inoculated, but we did damage this gut for a really long time and we have to fix it. So the, and this might take the longest from everything. Um, and this might take weeks, this might take months. We have to give nutritional support to help heal the intestinal lining. Okay, so we remove the offending agent, but now we have to help heal it. And as I said, this will take time. There are a million supplements that can help, but there's two that I really want to focus on. One is called L-glutamine, which really rejuvenates the gut wall. And the second is called collagen, which breaks down to amino acid, which helps, again, the gut wall. Um, for those of you who are meat eaters, I do recommend bone broth because it has that natural collagen in it. But certainly if you're not a meat eater, there are other ways to get it. But I want you to focus on that. And of course, a nutritious diet. We're not going to get into the specific of, of diets because if anyone works with me, they know that I try to make it as tailored to people's needs, people's genetics. It's not a one size fits all. But there are some basic rules we need to follow. We need good nutrients. We need good photonutrients. Photonutrients is what gives us color. It's not enough to just eat greens. We need the, the reds, the purples, the blues, the yellows. We need the whole rainbow, proteins, fats, and carbs. And when I say carbs, I don't mean pizza. I mean vegetables. Okay, just make sure you know that. So we talked about the four R's, okay? Remove, replace, re-inoculate, repair. 